very much. Welcome, everyone. And Jan, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Tobias. So today I'm going to talk about unemployment and child maltreatment during the COVID-19 pandemic in Korea. So when we look at the, the previous uh, the studies, the crisis and economic recessions exacerbated risk factors for violence against children. And the child maltreatment can uh, cause a disruption in early brain development and lifelong physical and mental health problems. And there are the previous literature, but unfortunately, most of them are for developed countries and maybe the lack of data is one of the main uh, the reasons. So when we uh, so look at the examples in the past, so natural disaster is one type of uh, the crisis. And then the study by Keenan and others show that after Hurricane Floyd in US in 2002, the traumatic brain injury, which is one of the most severe uh, the cases of child abuse, increased five times in affected areas. And another study by Melissa uh, shows that uh, after flooding in Australia in 2011, the inflicted child injury rate in, uh, significantly increased. So this shows natural disaster is uh, somehow related to the child maltreatment. And another type of crisis is the uh, disease epidemic, like pandemic uh, currently going on. So in the past, there was a Ebola epidemic and the study by Kostelny shows that uh, during e Ebola epidemic in West African countries, non-accidental injuries and child abuse cases increased in affected countries. And the another, uh, the last type uh, in my presentation is the economic recession. So uh, the study by Berger et al. shows that after Great Recession in 2007 to 9, the rate of abusive head trauma among children significantly increased in U.S. And also another study by Schneider and others show that uh, the Great Recession was significantly associated with the risk of child abuse in the U.S. So these studies shows that the crisis uh, is also related to the invisible, usually from outside, uh, the child maltreatment. And the, another study about the lifelong impact of child abuse uh, is uh, it's a study by uh, Johnson, Raid and others. They followed around 6,000 children from 1993 to 2009 in US. And they showed that uh, the more times of abuse or neglect during uh, the childhood, the worse were the behavioral and mental health problems. Uh, uh, for example, substance use or violent delinquency and suicide, assemb uh, suicide attempts, etc. So, so these are the background uh, about the relationship between crisis and disasters and uh, child maltreatment. And when it comes to risk factors, there are lots of risk factors for child maltreatment. And one study by Peterson and others uh, well documented the risk factors at uh, four different levels. Uh, first, at the individual level, especially for parents, the risk factors include uh, parents' past experience of abuse or neglect during their childhood, and early childbearing, for example, teenage mothers, and the parents' mental health. Those are the risk factors. And and the second, the risk factor thing, uh, is about family level. So the risk factor at family level include family structure, uh, so, uh, for example, nuclear family or STEM family or single mother, single father. 
etc. And also whether there is intimate partner violence is another family level risk factors for child maltreatment. And also low interaction with community uh, is another risk factor at family level. And the next level is contextual factors. In their study, they mean uh, the contextual factors are poverty and unemployment and neighborhood characteristics. And the, the last level is cultural factors. So in, in some societies or in cultures, the violence against children is an accepted form of um, solving problems within the family. So in those uh, culture, the child maltreatment is less likely to be treated as a, as a problem. So the COVID-19 pandemic is related to at least one risk factors for the first three levels. So for example, already our emerging studies shows that those risk factors has, has been exacerbated since COVID started. So in Singapore, Chong and others shows that uh, the increased parental stress during COVID was a significant factor in increasing harsh parenting, such as spanking and yelling. And in US, uh, the study by Lawson and others shows that uh, the children during COVID, during COVID, uh, the children were more likely to be maltreated when they are under the parents who lost jobs and also more depressed. And so, and then in France, it shows in a month following lockdown, intimate partner violence increased by 36%, uh, which is another risk factor for uh, child maltreatment. And then lastly, in a study by Wong and others for Hong Kong, the income reduction and job loss uh, amplify the risk of severe child uh, physical abuse during the COVID pandemic. So, so this shows the COVID-19 is all, uh, the, uh, somehow related to risk factors, but in addition to these risk factors, uh, this the current situation adds uh, the more layers of risk factors. Uh, first, the lockdown uh, makes abused children difficult to escape the house. And the school closure means the main channel of uh, spotting the word and reporting suspected cases is closed down. Uh, in Korea and in many other countries, the main channel of uh, identifying and reporting suspected, uh, suspected cases of child abuse is through teachers, but because of the school uh, closure, this the main channel has been closed down uh, quite some time in Korea. And I think this is the um, same case in many other countries. And another risk factor is uh, during the COVID uh, disruptions in services against child maltreatment uh, precluded spotting and reporting those cases. The UNICEF already uh, reported that during the COVID-19, the 90 out of 136 countries reported a uh, disruption in any services against child maltreatment. And this includes uh, visiting households at, at risk and then uh, case management services and referral, such as uh, referring the victims to shelters or uh, the hospitals. And also violence prevention programs uh, has been stopped in many countries. And so probably due to these reasons, uh, the reported cases of child abuse decreased uh, by 75% in Canada and by 42% in Denmark after, uh, right after lockdown. And uh, even if there are a lack of data for developing countries, uh, I think this will be uh, similar in many other uh, the developing countries. So given now uh, this old background, 
uh, uh, in this research, I wanted to see so if there is a, uh, the association between unemployment due to COVID-19 with uh, child maltreatment in Korea. So for this, I used uh, province level data. So uh, this is first administrative division in Korea. And it, this includes seven cities and nine provinces. So as a proxy for child maltreatment cases, I used uh, helpline calls related to child abuse and neglect, which was reported by National Police Agency monthly. And for COVID-19 variables, I included uh, the number of cases, uh, confirmed cases per capita, which was aggregated at uh, the monthly level for each province. And as a proxy for lockdown, I used the daily mobility per capita, for, uh, which was also at the monthly basis. And for unemployment rate, I used the total and female and male unemployment rate and which were available at uh, the monthly basis. And I also included uh, control variables, which were uh, the province characteristics that are potentially related to child maltreatment. And these include GDP per capita and the income per capita, so personal income per capita, and male to female population, and share of adult population, and average household size, and nonviolent crime rate, and violent crime rate. Violent uh, crime, uh, this means the murders, and rapes, and et cetera, those are very severe violent crimes. So these are data that I used for the analysis. So uh, this shows uh, just descriptive uh, statistics uh, of monthly helpline calls per 10,000 children. This is nationwide uh, since 2016 February up to uh, this year, March. And as you see, first, uh, the one observation from me, uh, this is that uh, for the period after COVID started, on average, the number of uh, helpline calls uh, is higher than the previous years. And the second observation uh, in this graph is the pattern. So for the previous four years before COVID, uh, for, uh, for every year, the patterns of helpline calls were similar. So during like January or February, it was low and then it started to go up. And during August, it, uh, it, uh, it becomes the peak at the uh, helpline calls and again goes down toward the, um, the December and January. And this seasonality is because during July or August, it is the summer in Korea, so it is relatively easy to spot uh, the child abuse cases. But uh, toward uh, the, uh, December and January in winter, uh, it's it's not easy because because of cold uh, cold weather, people are bundled up with many clothes, uh, many pieces of clothes, and then so it's it's visually it's hard to spot and also. There is a the winter vacation uh, in school, so this main channel of uh, the teachers, uh, this main channel is uh, closed down during winter, so the helpline calls are goes down. And this is not proved in this is not proved in my study, but this is commonly mentioned uh, reasons in Korea by government, and they explain these uh, patterns. But uh, after COVID started, this pattern just uh, this pattern disappeared. So usually August is at the peak, but uh, during COVID it is not the case, and and so this just pattern doesn't show up. So maybe this is again related to all those uh, the 
potential reasons described before. So school closure uh, means just main channel is shut down. So teachers cannot uh, anymore uh, the spot or report the abuse cases. And also uh, in Korea, uh, so some services such as regular visit of a household at risk was uh, just stopped in some regions. And then just uh, the overall, just uh, the lockdown measures just make, made uh, it difficult uh, for people just to, uh, to, sh to just report or spot the abuse cases. So there are many, there could be many uh, the reasons behind this. But anyway, the, this, the normal pattern has just disappeared during COVID-19 period. So, uh, and then, so in my analysis, I used excess, excess helpline calls for each province and month uh, because I had historical monthly data in helpline calls. So this is what I did. So this graph shows helpline calls per 10,000 children for a certain province. And, and the bar shows up for July from only for July from 2016 to onwards. And what I did uh, was uh, that the, to run the linear, the simple linear regression um, with the data with these four points just to get the time trend. And then I uh, predicted uh, the points for uh, the period after COVID started. So in this case, 2020. And then the gap between the actual uh, the helpline codes and then this predicted helpline codes uh, was used as uh, the, the excess helpline codes for this province and in July. So I did this uh, for all the provinces for each, uh, for each month. So this is the excess call, uh, helpline codes I used of in my analysis. <clears throat> so this graph shows uh, the calculated excess helpline codes per 10,000 children. This is, uh, this is nationwide. And when you see the excess, uh, this graph, uh, the, the excess helpline codes were, has been positive for most uh, month since, uh, since the COVID started, except for the first March to May. <clears throat> and in this period, when in, in early stage of pandemic, there was a very intensive lockdown in Korea. It was nationwide. And the schools were just closed down, and all the uh, the prevention, uh, the services were just stopped. So the main channels uh, were just uh, closed down. And so the, it was very hard to spot the child abuse cases. And but toward the May, they the government just restarted some services, and to identify child abuses. Uh, and then also school started not fully, but half online, half offline. So in this way, the school somehow um, opened up uh, partially. And then after that, the excess number of calls uh, has been positive. So this means the excess helpline calls has been higher than expected based on the historical uh, helpline calls for the last four years. So uh, in this graph, uh, it shows the nationwide excess helpline codes uh, compared to mobility. So the mobility here, uh, I mean, I calculated mobility uh, using the data uh, for 2019 and, and 2020 and 21. The baseline was 2019. So I calculated proportional change in average daily mobility per capita as compared to the same month in 2019, so which is a pre-COVID period. So, and then this orange line shows that proportional change of mobility uh, since COVID started. So when you see this, 
uh, these two variables tend to go uh, or, or go in the same direction together. Once mobility goes down, the excess helpline cost tends to decline. And when the mobility goes up, the excess cost tends to go uh, in a positive direction. And as you know, the, the lower mobility means uh, the more intensive mobility restrictions. And again, with mobility re uh, intensive restrictions, uh, those main channels and especially schools were closed down and it's hard to uh, spot the abuse cases. And maybe that's why the excess cost goes down as mobility goes down. But, but there are, could be other regions such as our unemployment rate and others. Um, yeah, so, and the next one, uh, this shows uh, the excess helpline calls uh, compared to the unemployment rate, which is one uh, of the main variable in this study. And so the lines show the unemployment rate and when you see this in, in the early phase, uh, these two variables seems to be unrelated, but since June 2020 until January 2021, they move in the same direction. So when the unemployment rate uh, goes down, the excess number of calls also uh, tends to go down. And once unemployment goes increase sharply since November, up to January, and then the excess goal tends to uh, just just trend on an average tends to go up. So, but and also looking at the specific uh, the unemployment rate uh, for female and male, they tend to be similar uh, up until like November 2020. But since uh, December, the female unemployment was much higher than the male unemployment rate. And after January and toward March, these two uh, rates converged. But still, female unemployment uh, is higher than uh, the male unemployment rate. So I use, in my study, uh, I use the logistic regressions. So the main outcome was uh, excess headline calls as I explained before, it was uh, per 10,000 children for, uh, and it was province and month specific. And the time horizon for the analysis was from February 2020 to March 2021. I started from February uh, because the first case was uh, confirmed in late January 2020. And for and here I uh, created one more variable, uh, which uh, is for mobility restriction, which is just uh, the uh, just uh, I just multiplied minus one with mobility uh, for easy interpretation in the result. So I had two models. So first model I used overall unemployment rate. So in this model. The excess helpline calls was a function of mobility restriction and infection rate and unemployment. And these three uh, variables uh, were uh, lagged by one month. I uh, lagged, uh, yeah, I used the lagged variables to minimize endogeneity between excess calls and these uh, variables. And also, I included those. Uh, the confounders that could be related to child maltreatment, and which are the province specific. And I also included province and time fixed effect. So the confounders were examined without province fixed effects. And with fixed effect, the confounders were, uh, they disappeared because they are uh, the province specific uh, characteristics. And that was the first model. And then in the second model, I separated into a female and male unemployment rate instead of overall. And others were uh, the same. And considering uh, the, the data structure, 
I used the clustered robust standard error estimation, treating provinces as clusters. So this is the result. Under uh, the first model, which use uh, overall unemployment, there are two cases. One, the left column is without province effect, uh, fixed effects, and the second with the province fixed effects. So in the first uh, result under first model, the mobility restriction was uh, slightly significant. So the more intensive restrictions, the less um, the excess helpline calls. And also, but uh, infection rate was not significant. And unemployment rate, the overall rate was slightly significant in the first model. And looking at the province specific characteristics, uh, the GDP and crime rates and the demographic feature such as male or adult, those were not significant, but uh, there were two significant uh, uh, variables. One was income per capita. In a province with a higher income per capita, the excess number of calls was higher when everything is the same. And also in the province with, uh, with a larger average household size, the number of excess helpline calls uh, was lower when everything is the same. And but after including the province fixed effect under the first model, the mobility restriction stays the same with a slightly significant and negative coefficient but overall unemployment rate uh, became insignificant. And now in sh uh, shifting to the second model with female and male unemployment rate. Uh, in this model, uh, so when you see the first one uh, without uh, province fixed effects, the mobility restriction was not significant anymore. Infection rate is not significant, but a uh, male unemployment rate was uh, strongly significant. And even if, uh, so when you see the female unemployment rate, uh, it's not significant, but the thing uh, to notice uh, is that it has a negative sign. So it's opposite to male unemployment rate. And also when it comes to the characteristics of province, uh, it stays that the consistent with uh, the first model, the income per capita was a strongly significant variable, and also the household size uh, with negative sign it was slightly significant. And when I included uh, province fixed effects, the uh, the result stayed the same. Uh, the others were not significant, but male unemployment rate was strongly significant. And again, the female unemployment, even though it's not significant, the, the sign of coefficient was negative. So it shows at least the direction of those impact was opposite um, for female versus male unemployment rate. So this was the this is the result of my um, this uh, preliminary uh, analysis. So in summary, uh, just descriptive statistics shows the excess helpline codes based on the historical trend for the last four years shows that uh, there has been a, a positive more helpline calls during COVID-19 period uh, than the expected based on the history of the helpline calls. And the only exception was for the early stage of pandemic when there was a uh, nationwide strong the lockdown measures. And so the analysis showed that the un increase of male unemployment was significantly associated with the increase in the excess helpline calls 
And again, the female unemployment rate, even though it's not significant, has uh, the opposite uh, sign of coefficient. And in provinces and cities with uh, higher income per capita, the excess applying cost uh, was higher, was significantly higher. And also in provinces uh, with a larger average household size, the excess helpline codes uh, were significantly lower. And these findings are consistent with some previous studies. And the study by Lindo and others for US, they showed the child maltreatment increased with the rise of male unemployment, but on the contrary, uh, it decreased with the rise of female unemployment, which is, uh, in, which is similar to my finding that shows uh, the opposite a sign of coefficient for female and male unemployment rate. And, and another study by Palotra and others, uh, they used data from 31 developing countries and they showed uh, an increase in male unemployment was significantly associated with an increase in domestic violence. And they went further and to analyze this pattern across countries. And they found that this pattern emerged from uh, mainly from countries where women have more limited access to divorce than men. So this study implies that the problem is not just uh, male unemployment rate. The root cause uh, is maybe more complicated than just unemployment rate. But in this study, uh, I don't go uh, further into those. And another study by Sanz Barbero and others for Spain, and the unemployment rate and also income inequality were significantly associated with uh, likelihood of domestic violence. So this, uh, this uh, their finding gives me some insight when, uh, when I look at the, the significant uh, the variable, the high income per capita, uh, just income per capita. So maybe when everything is the same, uh, the income loss due to unemployment may uh, may um, like increase income inequality in province with higher uh, the income per capita. So if that's the case, and 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 also if income inequality is a risk factor, then then the income inequality may have been uh, the channel from the higher income per capita to the higher excess helpline cause. But this is just my, um, just, yeah, my guess. But yeah, so yeah. So there could be another reasons behind this, uh, the significant result for income per capita. So another study that, uh, uh, that is uh, by Ter Pratt, and this author look at the association between unemployment and domestic violence, but uh, from the culture approach in terms of family uh, structure. So this author showed there is positive association between male unemployment and domestic violence, but it is the case in a nuclear family environment. And, and this positive association uh, is offset when it comes to a STEM family environment where uh, three generations or more live together. And in my finding, uh, this shows the, large, the larger household size is uh, related to less excess helpline cause maybe in the same line uh, with this study. So more household uh, members than the less likely uh, hood for the child maltreatment. Yeah. So and this is uh, the summary. And so throughout the study, the main uh, limitation is that the number of helpline codes, uh, although it is 
uh, it is correlated, it is highly correlated with a number of actual cases of child maltreatment. It is not necessarily equal to access uh, cases. So there could be some biases when it comes to this outcome variables. So yeah, so this is the uh, this is it for my study. Uh, and any comments and questions are welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Yang. Very nice talk. Um, there are a number of questions here. So, um, so the first question I didn't see it because it was pushed up. My chat window is too small. So my apologies to Shafat during the talk. He asked, "Does this only include direct violence against children or indirect effects to?" parental fight. So I think what Shafat refers to here is these calls to the headline. If you only if you know if it's only violence directly against children or if it can be other forms of um, domestic violence that you're capturing there. Uh, so you maybe mean you it, can just quickly answer this directly, yes. It is only about child maltreatment. So it doesn't include other forms of domestic uh, the violence. So in Korea, there is a specific helpline called 112 for the child maltreatment. So this includes only uh, child maltreatment and it doesn't include um, like intimate partner violence and other forms of domestic violence. Okay, thank you. Then, um, so let me ask the first question. And after that, we have Aditya Norman and Lisa in line. So maybe you just want to um, collect those four questions and then start answering. So my question slash comment is that, so you, so, so you have seven cities, nine provinces. I assume that the data you're using is only available at these somewhat more aggregate level. But given the total number of observations you have, you essentially, in your analysis, you essentially look at, um, the last year and a half during COVID, right? You don't have a lot of observations in there in your regression that are pre-COVID. That is my impression. So why wouldn't you go back further in time? And then the other thing is that it seems to me what you're really after is to look at this effect of unemployment. Now, if you're interested in the effect of unemployment on child violence, would you You could probably take advantage of a longer time series in your data and then look if there was any particular structural break once COVID kicked in or once you had these lockdowns. Uh, and I wonder if this would give you some additional mileage as to the interpretation of your results. I see. And then, so the order here we have first Aditya, then Norman, and then Lisa. So Aditya, please go ahead with yourself. Thank you, Yang, and I think it is a really nice presentation and on a really important question. I have a few uh, minor observations. One is, I, I think when it comes to mobility is an example of a variable where you confound the incidence, something that contributes to the incidence of the disease and the detect or the uh, violence and the detection of the incident. So I think it is a, uh, because you would expect limited mobility means people stay at home and get sick of each other and frustrated, but you also use it as a problem of measurement that you're not able to detect it. So I think that variable, there might be a mismeasurement issue which affects the consistency of, you know, even your estimates on the unemployment rate. The second question I have is that when you use just at least graphically the increasing trend to detect ac excess calls, it's not clear to me that the trend is linear. So, you know, if you have some reason, at least visually, it didn't seem linear. So that again might be a mismeasurement issue. The third question I have is that if there is this literature on unemployment and um, I think it's the slide before this one. If you look at the slide before this one, the, yeah. So 
So, and uh, if you have this literature on unemployment and child abuse, I think it would be interesting to look at what makes COVID different? Why is it interestingly different from other episodes on up unemployment? Is there a conjunction of features of people being trapped at home and unemployed and so on? And that's also an important reason that other factors, your like the lack of mobility are measured probably. And then you can think of interaction effects, which make this particular episode of unemployment interestingly different from others. And my final point is that is child violence conceptually or empirically, I'm saying interestingly, but is it sounds like a callous term, but interestingly different from gender-based violence. So the work that Hilary and Lisa have done, what do we learn from those models? Is Are the determinants, is the phenomenon importantly or interestingly different? Do you see coincidence of these different types, which is Shafat's question? or just in terms of what drives this type of violence. I think that might help also to this, especially this question of why COVID and this unemployment is different might help you also to differentiate the paper from the other literature. Thank you, but otherwise very nice, thank you. Norman, please. Oh, thanks. Oh, well, thank you very much, Jan. Uh, I think it's an interesting uh, paper, very good presentation on a very sad topic. Uh, and I um, support the comments that that, that Rias and Aditya have made. In fact, my comments uh, were going to go in that uh, direction. I have just a couple of things to, to add. One is that you uh, may want to distinguish between the early and late stage stages of the pandemic in your regression model. Because as you pointed out, in the, the early stage, that might, might be uh, under measurement. And in the late stage, this may this issue may be solved. So uh, in fact, uh, by distinguishing these two, early and late stages, you might be able to address at least some of the concerns that Aditya has on, uh, on um, mismeasurement. Uh, the second question is in relation to uh, this um, possibility that uh, male unemployment is um, worse for child violence than female unemployment. And um, one way of, uh, of uh, assessing how this dynamically interacts in a household is by looking at places where actually there is a male unemployed in the house and female is employed and all the combinations of this. But you are treating, uh, I believe these are male and uh, female unemployment rates just separately. But in a, you can have, I mean, the worst possible scenario could be one where the male is unemployed and the female is employed so that uh, the mother could not help the child if the child is being abused by the father. And can only later make the call. So I think that if you want to stress that uh, or want to add to that literature, this is a case where you might want to, uh, to get more results from if you have this information at the intra-household level. And finally, if you have um, data on who the perpetrator is, and if you do, then this may actually have a confirming evidence that if male employment is behind it, this, this is really because there's a male in the house who is frustrated, and who, is, who has become the perpetrator of these abuses. Um, Okay, good. But uh, I also wanted to say that uh, I think Tobias uh, case for making uh, extending the sample to before the pandemic and then testing by means of uh, maybe uh, an interaction, the pandemic effect is, is really a good one. Thanks. Lisa? I can. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan. 
I think that I found it very interesting. Thank you very much for the paper. Um, I think that one of my comments kind of echoes Normans and Adityas. I do think that the question about our uh, unemployment and um, child abuse is a broader and very interesting one. And when you were presenting, I kept thinking why you why you focus only on what is happening during the pandemic rather than looking at it more broadly and checking how pandemic has exacerbated it. My second point is on identification. And um, I think that your um, so you're looking at the relationship between child maltreatment and unemployment. And as you have mentioned, the um, given that you're looking at it in the context of the pandemic, the pandemic may affect the, um, the, the reporting as well as the actual incidents. So I was wondering whether you can try to instrument your unemployment variable by looking at the industry structure at the province level, because we know that some industries have been affected more than others, and you wouldn't expect the industry mix to be directly affected to the likelihood of child abuse, but you may expect it to have an impact on unemployment rate during the pandemic. So I'm wondering whether that could strengthen your identification strategy, because you are controlling for mobility restrictions, but it looks like your identification strategy relies on the assumption that mobility restrictions capture the ability to report violence, and then um, in this way you kind of disentangle reporting from incidents. So I think that trying to play with the instrument, looking at the industry mix at the province level, could potentially strengthen the identification strategy. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for all the comments. Now these are very useful. And yes, uh yeah, I agree that uh the mobility uh the variables is yeah, it has multiple relationship with other variables. It's a relations between infection rate and the reporting of child abuse and and then child abuse itself also. And then, yeah, this entangled relationship is not clearly teased out in this uh, in this analysis. And so, yeah, so, and I think those, those suggestions uh, will somehow contribute to solving these problems. Um, for the, the easiest part, I can tease out uh, as Norma suggested, the early phase and in and other phases. So maybe this measurement issue may be somehow uh, the somehow a bit uh, solved, uh, and I I can try it easily. And 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 unfortunately, I didn't have a household level data, so uh, maybe hard to uh, have this matrix of female and male and unemployment, uh, this matrix and yeah. So, and so about, uh, about the long term, uh, the time horizon, yes, maybe I was too much focused on using excess helpline calls uh, and as Tobias and others, and then I suggested uh, having just pre and the after the COVID and having just the long time horizon since some years back may give more uh, the robustness in this analysis. And also, yeah, and using the IV strategy, at least for unemployment rate, as uh, Dalisa suggested, will also, of course, um, yeah, make it more robust. So, yeah, I really appreciate uh, all those comments and I hope. I will be able to report or oh, have another half big thing <laughs> once uh, it is done uh, again with all those comments. And yeah, thank you very much. It, it, all those comments are really uh, helpful. Thank you. Then we have Andy. Andy also had a question. Please unmute yourself. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, so let me just echo what others have said, um, that this is a, a really nice presentation and on a really important topic. And at least in, in, in the world in which we're operating, I think uh, under-researched uh, compared to, um, to say, gender-based violence, which Parenthetically, I, I never thought I would say that uh, things were under-researched in, 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 in development less than gender-based violence, but uh, so I, I guess there's some good news on, on, on that side, but, but an, an important area that you're focusing on. Um, I think, so my main comment echoes, I think, what, uh, what others have also raised, and, and, and this is the... Uh, the issue of trying to uh, trying to disentangle the differences the difference between the actual incidence of uh, child maltreatment and the incidence of of reporting uh, of of maltreatment. So, um, uh, because it's not completely clear, and, and, you know, and there may be other literature that helped. I don't I don't have any specific methodological suggestions, but there may be some other literature that helps you uh, on this, um, but uh, I, I think you'll need to say something more about this, at least qualitatively, from other literature, if if not uh, if not dealing with it methodologically. And just to give you, you know, uh, a, a sense of where that confounding uh, effect is is problematic. I mean, if you just look at one of your control variables, the interpretation of of, um, of how household income is associated with with maltreatment. You have a you had a, if I remember correctly, a positive significant coefficient. Does that mean that um, places with higher household income have higher levels of maltreatment, or do or do they have greater diligence in reporting it? So. But that sort of that kind of a distinction, I think, pervades across uh, everything. So you'll need to, you know, you'll you'll need to find the best feasible way to kind of kind of sort that out. The um, what, one other thing, and I don't know how helpful this will be in answering that the 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 measurement question. But um, uh, but you mentioned early on that um, that schools were an important place for the identification of maltreatment uh, and reporting of maltreatment. And I know that um, in some work we've done elsewhere on human capital that there is data on uh, school closings. And I wonder whether school closings might be an interesting uh, alternative to mobility restrictions, uh, alternative or addition. Uh, to mobility restrictions, to to see to either explain reporting, <laughs> or to explain uh, 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 maltreatment. I, I think probably in your interpretation, it's uh, it, it has to do with reporting. Um, and then just one small comment, also on an interpretation of a. Uh, uh, of uh, control variable, and I don't know if there's any literature on this, but you have a the household size variable, and you saw that um, households, uh, larger households uh, report, or provinces with larger households report less uh, maltreatment. So um, is again, is this, uh, is it that there's a protective factor that seemed to be your interpretation, uh, I think, of larger households? Or is it simply that in large households, children get lost and, and therefore, uh, therefore um, violence or maltreatment is just not observed and reported? So there are a few interpret interpretive, you've got some measurement factors and then those, those have uh, some implications for interpretation that I think would benefit from some additional thinking and um, but uh, but again, very important topic and very interesting uh, effort that you're engaged in. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for thanks. Uh, yeah, for all the comments. 
Yes, uh, when it comes to school closure, maybe, yes, I can, I guess I will be able to construct a variable for school closing. It's not going to be uh, easy because <laughs> information is just scattered. And so, yeah, I can try with that as additional or alternative of uh, the mobility restrictions. And yeah, when it comes to this, uh, the reports and actual cases. Yes, at least qualitative studies will be uh, helpful. And because uh, one another, uh, I'm I have been trying to get data on uh, not just the uh, data uh, the data I was trying to get uh, from national police agency was the arrest rates, not just the the number of helpline calls but the actual the cases that were arrested among those uh, reports. So that arrest rates uh, will give uh, a hint on the actual cases. So hopefully this will go through successfully, but uh, that's, uh, that's, I'm not sure, but at least our explanation are using qualitative uh, the studies as basis uh, will will clear out um, this confusion or the bias in uh, measurement of our child abuses cases and as compared to actual cases. So yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Yang, for a great presentation and thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, before you log off, please look in the chat box. I posted a survey link there. Please fill out this very short 10 second survey. It will be a great help for us. And other than that, again, thank you very much, Yang. And I hope to see you here, same time, same place, fairly uh, soon. Tobias, I don't see this. Do other people see this? Yeah, I don't see the, uh... it's in the chat box. It you have maybe scroll up a little bit because Lisa and Norman posted more messages, so it moved up and probably left your window. It's not, but it's in the it's chat not, box, it's not here anymore. There anymore? No. Okay. Let me see if I can post it. Enter. Ah, okay, wait, that was one I only accidentally only sent them sent it back to Isati. My apologies. It appeared in my window, but not everyone else's. So now it should be there. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks for pointing that out. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Have thank a good you. day in Washington. Good night over here. Thank you. Good evening. Bye, thank you. Bye.